This session is how smart card payment systems fail, um, presented by uh, Professor Ross Anderson. He is a uh, professor of security engineering at Cambridge University and author of Security Engineering. So thank you, and uh, please enjoy the briefings. Thanks. <clears throat> So America's in for a big change in how you pay for stuff. Um, since the 1960s, people have been using credit cards based on magnetic strip. And starting round about now, the banks are starting to introduce credit cards which are based on chips instead. Now, we've been using these in the UK for 11 years now. And um, we've got quite a lot of experience of how they break. We started off at the beginning figuring out that we understood what the likely shortcuts were that had been taken in design and we thought we knew what the fraud would be, but reality turned out to be rather different. And over the past dozen years, my team and I have been monitoring this. Um, we've picked up and investigated quite a number of um, rather ingenious hacks against the system. And there are, we think, some uh, pretty interesting and important lessons um, for people to learn in America as you start uh, uh, building it and deploying it here. Now, chip and pin is known formally as EMV, Europe Pay MasterCard Visa. Um, the card brands basically settled a big smart card patent dispute in 1995, and then spent the late 1990s evolving a specification and testing it. And this started being rolled out in the UK in um, 2003. It became mandatory in the UK um, for new issued cards to be chip and pin cards by 2006. And one by one, countries in Europe and Canada followed. In theory, um, all banks in the USA have got to start deploying chip and pin for new card issued by 2015. But the, but the industry isn't that disciplined, and it's going to be interesting to see how things develop. Now, there's a, an enormous story of failures and frauds, and there's a lot of general lessons uh, for security engineers in what happened. Now, the concept of operations behind EMV cards is quite simple. If you replace the magnetic strip, which is easy to copy, with a chip, which is a lot harder to copy, then that makes um, card copying more difficult. The chip authenticates the card. At the same time, you want to authenticate the card holder using possibly stronger methods. And in many countries, in all countries in Europe, the default way of authenticating a card holder is a PIN. So when you go to a merchant uh, terminal to do a point of sale transaction in Europe, usually it asks you to enter a PIN. And the PIN is verified by the chip itself. Um, ATM transactions are done as they have always been. And some countries have decided not to use PINs. Singapore, for example, decided not to use PINs uh, because they believe that PINs are bad for um, customer protection that if people are authenticated by pins rather than by signatures, it's more difficult for a customer to win a, a, a dispute um, issue with a bank. And that's an interesting question that we're going to see um, tried out in the USA because my understanding is that some banks are going to insist on you using your card with a pin at the uh, merchant point of sale, whereas other banks are going to go initially at least for a chip and signature card um, because um, they reckon it will be easier to deploy. Now, one of the other interesting things about EMV is how do you go about deploying it? Now, we all know about the many, many, many security systems that were beautifully designed by very clever engineers but never got any transaction in the real world, right? Because there are all the big network effects involved in deploying something. Who wants to use encrypted email if none of the people you exchange email with encrypt their email yet, right? We've all seen this problem. Sometimes we know how we can solve that. SSH, for example, got deployed because it gave you accession teleportation as well as a more secure version of our login. And so um, how can you get an incentive for people to actually use this stuff? Well, the idea the banks come up with is what they call liability shift. At present, if I, as a cardholder, dispute a transaction, then the bank simply passes that transaction back to the merchant. They do a chargeback. And if the merchant gets too many chargebacks, they get fined. And if they get even more chargebacks, then they get their credit card service withdrawn. So that's straightforward. So what the banks say to merchants is if you adopt EMV, if you spend all these millions of dollars on replacing your terminal fleet uh, with chip and pin terminals, then we guarantee 
that a properly authorized chip and pin transaction will always be good for funds. If the customer disputes it, then the banking system will take the hit rather than the merchant. And this liability shift, together with some changes in, together with a reduction in the interchange fee that the merchants pay, is what has been successful in Europe in inducing merchants to spend billions and billions of dollars over the last uh, 10 years in changing all the terminal fleets. So, here's the fraud history. The banks believed that by replacing magnetic strip card payments with a more secure alternative, um, they would be able to cut fraud. And as you can see, fraud went up, and then it went down, and now it's going up again. So there's some interesting things going on here, which I'll, I'll talk about briefly, and which we'll explain in later um, slides. So the top line is card not present fraud. That's basically stuff that happens on the internet. And as you see, the very first thing that the bad guys did when chip and pin was introduced is they started doing fraud online rather than in stores. The second line, the yellow line, that's counterfeit. And as you can see, what happened is that counterfeit initially went down because it's actually really, really hard um, to counterfeit uh, chip cards if you do it you know, by brute force the front door way. There are more subtle ways of doing it, which we'll discuss later, but the villains really haven't industrialized that. So what happened is that counterfeit fraud first went down, and then it went up again, because what the bad guys realized is that now that everybody's using pins everywhere, this means that you can harvest card and pin details from dodgy terminals anywhere, right? Because every merchant is now accepting pins from customers. Previously, customers only used their pins in ATMs. So if you wanted to steal um, card and pin details, you basically had to put a skimmer on an ATM you know, and risk being seen by the CCTV and detected by the physical alarms and so on. But since chip and pin was introduced, it became straightforward for people to either deploy dodgy terminals uh, or else to tamper with existing terminals or, 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 or even to use things like terminal malware. And once you have got um, credentials, then of course you can take them to America or to India or to Thailand or one of the countries that still does MagStripe and use the card in MagStripe fallback mode. There are various other um, lower level um, uh, uh, fraud modes that we'll, that we'll talk about. So there's also a moral hazard here because in the old days, the system, the banks and the merchants, were somehow liable. But what happened when you uh, introduced EMV was this, that if a transaction is said to have been a chip and pin transaction, then the merchant doesn't pay for it, the bank takes on the liability, and then the bank can go to the customer, and in many cases does go to the customer, and says, your card and your pin were used, therefore you were negligent or complicit. Therefore, it's your fault and we won't give you your money back. If, on the other hand, a pin wasn't used, the bank reverses the transaction back to the merchant. So look what's happened. The bank isn't liable for fraud anymore. And if the bank's not paying for the fraud, then why should the bank bust a gut to keep the system secure? This is one of the big untold stories of the chip and pin scenario. So this slide basically sums up what I said, that EMV was supposed to abolish fraud, or at least substantially reduce it, and it didn't. Fraud went up and then down, and now it's going up again. Card not fret present fraud shot up rapidly. Counterfeit fraud took a couple of years and then shot up once the crooks realized how to do it. And the overall effect was as if you had taken a bulldozer and driven it across the landscape, the rivers of crime are still flowing, they're just flowing in slightly different channels. So how might EMV be broken? Well, when EMV was first deployed, we went and looked at it from a technical security point of view. And a decade ago, for example, we were doing research in API security. If you have got a cryptographic hardware um, security module, then one of the ways that you attack it is that this security module has maybe hundreds and hundreds of different transactions. 
And so you stare at the manual for a few weeks until you find a combination of them that does something bad. And EMV made the transaction sets used by hardware security modules so much more complex that there were a whole lot of new API attacks. There was a transaction, for example, to encrypt a key to send it to a smart card. And it turned out that this was um, badly designed in that there was a variable length field which enabled you to locate the encrypted key block um, on any byte boundary you wanted. So you could guess keys a byte at a time. And then you could take master keys and encrypt them using this transaction to send to cards. And this meant that a dishonest programmer working in the bank could use the EMV apparatus to extract all the bank's cryptographic keys and thereby break the system. So hardware security module vendors had to spend some time working on that. And two research students that I had uh, working on that uh, project are now working for Square and for Deutsche Bank. So you know there was some fun, but this was good academic knockabout stuff uh, that got a couple of guys their PhD thesis and um, better jobs in the industry. This wasn't something that ended up at least immediately being used by the bad guys. The next thing that we thought about was the optimizations. Now, there's two types of EMV card, um, roughly speaking. There are cheap ones and expensive ones. The cheap ones, the static data authentication cards, only do DES or AES. And the expensive ones, the DDA cards, will also do RSA. Now, if you use a cheap card, that means that the smart card itself cannot make a digital signature. And this means that it, when it presents its credentials, it's simply presenting a static certificate to the merchant. This means uh, that you can make up a forged card which will impersonate um, a smart card if the terminal is offline. Because the only way that the merchant terminal can then tell whether you've got a genuine card is if it performs a cryptographic operation with the card and then sends it to the bank for checking. Because cheap smart cards, SDA cards, simply have a triple DES key which they share with the card issuing bank. Now, I'm going to describe the protocols in a later slide, but at the conceptual level, if you don't have public key capability, then forged cards will work in offline. And people worried at the start that this would be something that would be easy for the crooks to do. And there were one or two cases seen in France, but the amounts of money were trivial. They were just in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. And so the industry heaved a big sigh of relief and, hey guys, we don't actually have to start shipping expensive RSA smart cards anytime soon. So again, the attack that you expected in theory didn't happen in practice. Next, what about a false terminal? Back in 2005, a couple of my research students got one of these terminals and they took all its guts out and replaced them with some hobby electronics. And um, as you can see, this terminal is playing Tetris. And if you um, search on YouTube, you can find the video of this thing playing Tetris. Um, chip and pin terminal playing Tetris should get it. And we did this in order to emphasize that it was possible for people to build entirely false terminals or to t buy genuine terminals from eBay, gut them and replace the electronics with something that would capture cards and pins from victims. And we did see a bit of this later on, as I'll describe. However, what you can also do is something a little bit more subtle. And this was an attack that we also thought of at the beginning, to do a man-in-the-middle attack on a remote terminal in a merchant selling expensive goods. So how this kind of attack works is as follows. I build a parking meter, right? And I put some of these parking meters in a vacant lot. And you come up with your car. And you want to park, so OK, it's three pounds for two hours. So you put your chip and pin card in. right? And as you put your chip and pin card in, an alarm goes off in the headphone of somebody standing at Helsinki Airport. And he goes up to the cash machine and takes out 500 euros doing a real-time transaction against your card. Is this doable? Well, it's perfectly doable. We did a demonstration. We did it on TV. We got two students, one with a dodgy terminal in a cafe and the other with a laptop in his backpack and a card wired down his sleeve. And um, as the victim went in and used the terminal in the cafe, one of the students went into a bookshop and bought an expensive book. So this is a good proof of concept. But again, did we see this in the real world? It might be tempting. You know, because people buy very, very expensive stuff using chip and pin cards. 
right? The banking system in Europe is now completely relaxed about people using their bank cards to buy cars. That's now the default way of buying a car in Europe is just using your bank card, a full 40,000 bucks or whatever in one transaction. And if you're really rich, you can go and buy yourself a Learjet. You can go and spend $8 million on an airplane in one car transaction. So surely it would be worthwhile doing targeted attacks on high net worth individuals using this? Cool. Well, we haven't seen it. It was a great student exercise. It made a great movie. And again, you can find it on YouTube. But um, it seems never to have happened. So what did happen? Well, the first thing that happened was back in 2006, 2007, some bad guys went around Shell petrol stations in the UK. And they said, hi. Um, we're the pin entry device maintenance engineers. We've come to do maintenance on your terminal. And um, <laughs> so they took the chip and pin terminal and they did some maintenance on it and they had, you know, chatted very cheerfully to the petrol station operator. And, um, you know, hundreds of thousands to millions of pounds were stolen from cardholders. And the terminal vendor, Trintec, actually went bust. Right, because uh, Shell had to reverse all its filling stations to using the manual addressograph machines. Remember the old zip zap machines? They had to fall back to that for months and months and months while they went out and bought new terminals from another supplier. So um, that was a big deal. And then we started seeing a whole host of um, wiretapping attacks against BP garages. And um, in the UK, many of the BP garage franchises are owned by ethnic Tamils, and so there was a scare story in the press about how the Tamil Tigers, a terrorist group in Ceylon, was using this to harvest operational funds. And what was actually happening here was that guys would put a wiretap on the line that went from the pin entry device um, to the gateway in the branch, and that would get them the, cl the cl clear text of the transaction, since the pin entry devices don't actually encrypt their traffic to the bank. And they would then either use the CCTV within the branch or else install um, a video uh, camera in one of the ceiling tiles so that they would be able to capture the pins that the customers entered. And this got detected, in fact, when um, a policeman in um, Phuket in Thailand uh, noticed a chap using white plastic in a cash machine. So he arrested this guy, and he was offered on the spot a bribe of $35,000 to let the guy go. Um, but being a dutiful police officer, he refused. And um, so at this guy's hotel room, they found a suitcase with over 3,000 um, white plastic cards that had been encoded with the details of UK card holders that had been stolen from BP garages. And eventually, the police found a Mr. Patel in Croydon, whose garage contained exactly the sort of equipment that you find in our own tamper lab at Cambridge. So this is um, what was going on. So how did they get away with it? Well, in the later stages, what the bad guys were doing was putting wicked electronics inside the pin entry device itself. So in EMV, the pin entry device, that is, you know, the the chip and pin machine that you see on the retailer's counter, is supposed to be tamper resistant because firstly you enter your pin at it, so that's sensitive information which should be protected. And second, you get the, the cardholder credentials, your account number, CVV, um, certificates, and so on, flow from the card um, in the other direction. And so if you can wiretap into the pin entry device, you can get everything, right? If you simply wiretap into the shop network, you don't get the pin because the pin goes from the pin entry device to the card where the, where, where the pin is verified. And so if you went and looked at the Visa website, they, uh, they said that pin entry devices were supposed to be tamper resistant, that they were evaluated under the common criteria, and you can go and download the protection profile that they used. And according to this protection profile, it should cost $25,000 to defeat a pin entry device. That's not to find a class attack on a particular make of pin entry device. That is per physical unit. OK? So the idea is, just as it takes you a lot of money to get your iron beam machine and drill into a, an individual smart card, so it should cost you a huge amount of money to Trojan an individual pin entry device. So we went on eBay 
and um, we bought a dozen or so pin entry devices. And this is the inside of the Ingenico 3300, which is the most commonly used pin entry device in the UK at the time. And you can see where the, um, the four switches are highlighted in red. These are four studs under the keyboard, um, which, so long as the device is closed, depress or make contact on four switches on the um, keyboard PCB, which you can see above there, also outlined in red, and also shown on the side here. So if you open the shell of the device, then these switches go open circuit, and that causes the cryptographic key material within the pin entry device to be zeroed. In effect, it turns it into a brick. Right? Once that key material is gone, the banking system will no longer recognize that as a pin entry device. They put various other things in as well to make it supposedly very, very difficult so that, for example, where you have got some of the circuitry that's sensitive, they put tamper-responding, tamper-sensing meshes around it on little PCBs that stick up. And um, as you can see at the right-hand side of the PCB, some of the PCBs also have tamper meshes going through them at lower layers, so if you try and drill through them, um, you will either make something open circuit that should be closed or something closed circuit that should be open. And again, all the cryptographic key material is zeroized. So did this work? Well, um, if you let a couple of bright research students loose on a tamper-proof terminal, it often doesn't stay tamper-proof for very long. And so once they dismantled a few of these terminals and looked at them, a couple of my students, Sard Rimmer and Stephen Murdoch, observed that if you went in through the back of the terminal, and you can see in that compartment in the back there, there's a paper clip sticking in a little hole. Well, if you drill exactly there, you can evade the tamper detection mechanisms, and you can drop a contact onto the serial line that carries the pin from the pin pad to the card, and carries the credentials from the card to the pin pad. So there's one place where you have to drop a paper clip, and you get everything. And what's more, the terminal has got this little compartment in the back where you can conveniently put your wicked electronics. Now, we understand that the manufacturers offered the banks the option of putting a separate encryption unit in the back of the device there so that the traffic from the pin entry device to the bank could be encrypted. The banks couldn't be bothered. And instead, that provided a wonderful place for you to put bad stuff. So, we came to the conclusion that this pin entry device which supposedly cost $25,000 to tap, could actually be tapped with 10 minutes work and a few dollars worth of components. So um, we went to GCHQ, which runs the um, common criteria scheme in the UK, and we said, listen, Paul, this year common criteria evaluated pin pad, it's a lot of uh, old dingoes droppings, isn't it? Um, what are you going to do with the commercial licensed evaluation facility that inspected it? And GCHQ scratched its head and said, this isn't one of our problems, mate. Um, this thing was never common criteria certified. Oh, but Visa claims it's common criteria evaluated. Well, why don't you speak to Visa? So we did. And we went to sp and spoke to Visa, and they said, well, it, um, we agree it's not common criteria certified, because to get it certified, we'd have to share the evaluation report with GCHQ, and that would be bad for security. Um, OK. Fine. Um, so what did you do? I said, well, they said, we um, evaluated it according to common criteria principles and procedures using a CLEF, um, just as if it had been a common criteria evaluation, but then we kept the evaluation reports ourselves. Oh, I said. So we went back to GCHQ and we said, listen, mate, these guys are passing off your brand. They're undermining your trademark. Who the hell is going to believe in common criteria if this sort of rubbish gets advertised as a common criteria evaluation? And I said to GCHQ, look, you've got the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Why don't you just um, um, put a notice on Visa and MasterCard and Barclays and so on for passing off your trademark and tell them to stop it, otherwise you'll have their websites taken down. Oh, no, they said we could never do anything as aggressive as that. Well, hey. So following a responsible disclosure period, um, we went public with this in 2008. And the bank's trades union said that it wasn't a problem. You know, most bad guys aren't as clever as these Cambridge students, and they won't be able to do an attack like this. But, in fact, the bad guys were already doing an attack like this, and in July 2008, 
there's a couple of brothers called Khan were arrested in Birmingham for having had access to the warehouse in Dubai where these terminals went en route from the factory in China to the distribution network. And they were putting wicked electronics in them. And so for a period of time in 2008, you could go into a store in Britain or a bank branch in, in the Netherlands and you could put your chip and pin card in a pin entry device that they had just ordered from the factory in China. They took it out the wrapping, they put it on the table in their branch and they started doing business with it. Right? And this pin entry device contained wicked electronics that would take your card and pin details and would then SMS them to a guy in Karachi. So the Khan brothers got their collar felt and they were supposed eventually to be tried in October 2011 but they got off because the banks wouldn't um, provide any evidence against them because it was too embarrassing. So they not only got to steal a few million, they got away with it and they got to brag about it. Next attack, the no pin attack. Round about 2009, after Mr. Khan had been arrested, we got a number of people coming to us saying, you know, help, my card and pin have been used and, you know, after my card was stolen and the bank says, I must have compromised my pin but I didn't, I never wrote it down, they won't give me my money back, what could be going wrong? So, we investigated what could possibly be happening. How could you use a stolen chip and pin card without knowledge of the pin? And the responsible disclosure in this case involved disclosing it on the news night, which is the UK's main late evening news program. And let's see if we can roll the video. We will stay with the question of money because most of us don't think twice about paying for something in a high street shop by keying in our pin. It's easy, it's fast, and in most cases it works. But scratch a little under the surface and there are persistent reports of people who say they've been the subject of fraud of one kind or another on their credit card or their debit card. Now a team of computer scientists at Cambridge University has found a flaw in chip and pin so serious they think it shows that the whole system needs a rewrite. Our science editor Susan Watts has the story. We have to question the, the entire uh, architecture uh, that surrounds chip and pin. It really is time for um, a closer look to be taken in this whole area. But this flaw is really a whopper. Well, we think this is one of the biggest flaws um, that we've ever uncovered, that has ever been uncovered against payment systems. And, you know, I've been in this business 25 years. This is um, a flaw on a system that's used by hundreds of millions of people, by tens of thousands of banks, by millions of merchants. So how does the attack work? Essentially what it does is exploit a flaw in the chip and pin system that allows the terminal to think that a correct pin was entered and the card to think that a signature authorized the transaction. So at the end, the receipt says verified by pin. The bank is going to think that the pin was entered correctly, but uh, the criminal actually did not know the pin. Cambridge University gave us permission to see if the attack works in real life. The team set up in one of the university's cafeterias. We obviously don't want to give out too much detail, but in simple terms, SAR is hooking up the stolen card to a chip. This is controlled from a laptop and runs software written by the team. All of this is hooked up to a fake card which slots into the actual shop terminal. The kit wouldn't have to be this big. The team's already working on miniaturizing it into a unit the size of a remote control. Saar has a trick up his sleeve. His dummy card has a concealed cable running up his arm to the kit in his backpack. So will it work? Hello. Hi. He doesn't need to know the actual pin from the stolen card. Any combination should do. The stolen card is getting a message that the purchase has been authorized by signature. Hello. This mismatch should allow the transaction to go ahead. And yes, it does. The printout states it's been verified by PIN. In fact, Saar tried a handful of high street debit and credit cards, keying in 0000 as the PIN. Hello. 
and it works every time. So is this attack happening in the real world? The Consumers Association thinks chip and pin has helped to bring down instances of card crime, but many cases remain unexplained. It's very difficult to quantify exactly how big this problem is. What we do know from our um, investigations is that, say, around 14% of, of, of consumers on a representative basis will have said that they have suffered some kind of um, financial loss, which they believe is through fraud. The percentage of that which is actually from th uh, this type of potential problem with chip and pin is something that's a lot less clear. What we do know is that we do have cases that are brought forward from individuals which seem quite persuasive. We understand that behind the scenes, some of the banks are already working on fixing this flaw. But they obviously haven't all fixed it yet, because the banks didn't alert any of us to the purchases we made using the Cambridge attack, our cards, and a PIN 0000. So that's, in theory, a pretty simple attack. You just um, put a device between the card and the ped, and you tell the ped that the um, card accepted the PIN, and you tell the card that it was a chip and signature transaction. Now, it is possible to detect um, that this attack went on if you compare in detail the logs produced by the card with the logs produced by the ped, because they have different flags set. Uh, in the various uh, clusters of bits that get reported back. But it's harder than you might think, because where are you going to do this checking? Do you do it in the PED? That means reprogramming tens of millions of PEDs in the field, and they're run by acquiring banks, not by the issuing banks who are blaming their customers for this fraud. Do you do it in the network switches? Well, Visa doesn't want to admit that it was at fault in misdesigning the system so that this could happen. The specifications are very, very obscure on the point. If you're an acquiring bank, then in theory, if all the transactions um, are online, you should be able to spot this. But again, how much of an incentive do you have if you can just blame your customers for the fraud? And so while there's publicity about it, while there's an active attack in progress, you might want to try and do something about this. But the problem there is that if you turn on strict checking in your system, then it causes a very high rate of um, false alarms because payment services networks are as crafty as every other artifact that people like us build. They've been pulled together with string and sealing wax until they only just work. And there are lots and lots of kludges that have been put together to make things work. And so with strict checking, you may end up finding suddenly that you can't accept any transactions from Egypt or Hungary or China, for example. And that's just too painful. So if you're not aware of transactions in progress, then it's simpler to just not fix it. So let's look again at how this happens. A normal EMV transaction, you, the card sends the card details and, and the digital signature on these uh, details to the PIN entry device. The merchant then gets the PIN entered by the customer and the amount of the transaction and other things that describe the transaction. And then the um, card sends back a signal which says the PIN is OK, yes or no, and, and an ARQC, an authorization request cryptogram. The merchant terminal then sends the transaction with the cryptogram to the bank, uh, which then says basically yes or no. It checks the cryptogram. It checks that the cryptogram was computed using the triple DES key that was installed in that card, and it checks that there are funds available, that the card wasn't reported stolen, and, and so on and so forth. So all you have to do is um, basically erase the PIN uh, from uh, transaction number three, uh, and that's basically three lines of code, and the attack then basically runs from there. So all you need to do is to find a simple, compact, and reliable way of filtering the transaction between the card and the PIN entry device. And um, that's basically that set out in, um, um, in, in diagrammatic format. So what happened? Um, well, as I mentioned, after we um, revealed this on TV in February 2010, um, there was some activity in the banking sector. The banks said initially that this was an industry problem rather than their individual problem. 
One of the UK banks, Barclays, started blocking it in July 2010. They actually sent their suppliers over to meet us. There was a firm from um, Chicago that was actually writing the relevant software, came over and sat down with us and discussed options. And so for a period of almost six months, if your card was issued by Barclays, then you weren't vulnerable to this attack. But when we checked it again in December 2010, we found that in the run-up to Christmas, the defences had been turned off. We believe simply because it was costing too much business in terms of, uh, uh, of false alarms. The real problem here is that the EMV specification has become vastly too complex. There's four big volumes that we worked with, um, you know, something like um, 1,600 pages of uh, specifications. And then there are individual national specifications which describe the local hacks that various banks have put onto the EMV spec. And the information that we needed to implement the no-pin attack uh, was gathered, you know, was available, but it was in about 16 different places scattered, out, scattered throughout these four volumes. And the four volumes were more or less a documentation of the system that they'd eventually got working. It wasn't in any sense structured. There wasn't a clear description at the beginning of what they were trying to do, about what their threat model was, about what their security policy was, about the attacks they considered and what the various mitigations that they um, had designed to deal with that. What's more, the, the banks had set up a company, EMV Co, that was jointly owned by Europe, MasterCard and Visa, um, which designed this in the 1990s, but once their job was done, um, they appear to have you know, no longer very much in the way of either political clout or technical expertise. And the spec is now being driven um, by the vendor community, a hundred odd vendors, plus national banking associations have got their own little hacks that they put on top of this. And of course, when you've got an ecosystem with a hundred odd vendors and 20,000 banks and millions of merchants, you've got a governance problem. You end up with the tragedy of the commons in that nobody sees it as their job to step up to the plate and say, hey guys, it's about time that we refactored all this and wrote a proper EMV 5.0 specification. I did try and suggest to the Federal Reserve that they insist on this as a condition of letting EMV be deployed in the USA, but you know, the Fed doesn't have the kind of power that you would need to force the banks to do that. So how did the industry respond to our stuff? Well, later that year, they wrote to our university's PR department um, asking for the master's thesis of one of our guys, Omar Chowdhury, who'd been involved in this project to be taken offline in case it was of too much help to the bad guys. And we wrote back to them saying, hey, you know, the bad guys know this stuff already. Uh, because after all, it was the bad guys who discovered this attack. We merely followed in their footsteps and figured out what they were doing when the banks couldn't be bothered to do that. And at present, you know, we get out our machinery from time to time and we check this in the university cafeteria. And at present, last time we looked a few months ago, only HSBC appears to be blocking this attack in the UK. Now, it's not just the UK. There's a case that's been dragging through the courts in France for about three years. And what happened there is that some guys got stolen EMV cards from high net worth individuals and they put individual electronics, little components in the card, and I'll show you something similar in a few slides time, to implement this attack. And they managed to steal hundreds of thousands of euros. And the, the guys in that case um, have been tried, but the trial is currently at appeal and um, so the relevant materials are sealed. So this is a real attack and it's a protocol failure, and it's one that should have been detected at the start if people had been systematic about specifying what they were doing and why. It's a really, really trivial attack to spot if things are written down properly. But it's one that people overlooked because there isn't proper documentation. Other things. Another problem that we then came across is with the card authentication protocol. You remember from the um, graph that the um, initial response to the deployment of EMV was that we got a huge spike in moto, mail order, telephone order, um, online stuff. And so there was a push um, towards mechanisms that can be used um, online for online merchant transactions and in online banking. And one of the things that's been deployed in the UK is the card authentication protocol, 
Here you've got a little um, calculator and you stick your bank card in the calculator and the calculator asks for your PIN and um, it then may ask for a challenge that your bank has displayed on your screen or it may just generate a one-time authentication code that you use to log on to a system. It can even um, work out a message authentication code on some transaction data for you. Now, this sort of thing has been around for, oh, the first one was the Recal Watch World in 1980. And in a good design, what you do is you put in your PIN plus the challenge on which you want to compute a response. And the card then uses its key material to compute a response. Even if the PIN is wrong, you just get the wrong response. But the implementation failure that EMV did is that the card um, first tells you whether the PIN you entered is right or not and then it enters the challenge and then it computes the response. Now millions of these devices have been manufactured and put into general distribution. Banks like HSBC and the NatWest hand these out to many of their customers. And this means that if you get mugged at knife point in London now and you hand over a chip and pin card, um, the nice young gentleman can ask you what your pin is and he can check it on the spot with his cap device and um, if you give him the wrong pin, then he might, for example, um, cut your ear off and invite you to try again. And this is, you know, um, not always a joke because we had a, a couple of uh, students um, a few years ago um, got basically tortured to death by robbers. So putting in the hands of millions and millions of people the means to check bank pins is not a good idea. In the old days, the bad guy would have to frog march you to an ATM. Now he can check your pin in the back alleyway where he mugged you. The next problem that you have is that if you're going to use your chip and pin card to log on to an online banking system, then presumably what you're trying to do is to prevent phishing attacks. Are there interesting things that you can do to defeat this as a protection mechanism? Well, it's pretty suspicious if somebody puts up a phishing page which asks for your bank PIN. But what happens if they simply ask you to do a transaction with your CAP reader when they present stuff to you with a man in the middle attack? Well, it looks perfectly normal. And so you've got what appears to be a stronger means of protection, but actually ends up as something that dumps liability on you. And there's another thing that thing that can go wrong as well. Again, this is not something we've seen in the wild, but something that we've demonstrated. You can do cap attacks through wicked shops because some banks, but not all, implemented the EMV system in such a way that if I'm a, a bad merchant with a Trojan chip and pin terminal and you come to me with your bank card, I can not only do an EMV transaction to pay for your coffee, I can also then get my terminal to pretend that it's a cat reader and to get a few authentication codes from you to authenticate your next few bank logons. And if I can then somehow, for example by social engineering, um, find out other relevant information that I may need to access your online bank account, then of course I can go online and pretend to be you. Now we haven't seen this in the wild yet because the sort of things that people like Zeus do with man in the middle and man in the browser attacks are easier. But again, this is an example of how poorly implemented stuff can give just the appearance of security. And the curious thing is that some banks implemented their cap system in such a way as to be vulnerable to this, such as Barclays, whereas other banks, such as the NatWest, didn't. And it was all a matter of, I suppose, luck you know, the way stuff ended up being written, because I'm sure that nobody actually tested this. Now, the final um, attack that I'm going to discuss is EMV and random numbers. This is what we've been doing most recently. And what's basically happening here is that a high-level view of the EMV protocol is that the terminal sends a random number N to the card along with the date D and the amount X. There's a lot more stuff, but abstracting away what's relevant for this attack, this is what's happening. And the card then computes the authentication request cryptogram, the ARQC, on N, D, and X. So what happens if I could predict the random number N for the date D? The answer is that if I've access to your card, I can pre-compute an ARQC for amount X and date D. Okay? So random numbers matter. If random numbers are weak, or if they can be manipulated afterwards, then there's an attack on the system.
And how we discovered this was that a guy, uh, Mr. Gambin, came to us. He's a Maltese, and he'd been on holiday um, in Mallorca. And he went and ate at a restaurant that is suspected of having been owned by organized crime. And um, the following day, on the 28th of June 2011, four transactions appeared at a nearby ATM against his account, and HSBC duly paid up and then um, held him liable for the funds. So he disputed this, and we got the transaction logs. And if you look at the right-hand side there, you can see what the random numbers are that are generated by the ATM. F124, 6E04, F124, 1354. And hey, this looks a bit like a counter, doesn't it? You know, um, it looks like, in fact, uh, when you look at a number of, of more to such transactions, it looks like a 17-bit constant followed by a 15-bit counter that cycles every three minutes. So what we then did was to run some tests. And so we went and bought three ATMs on eBay, which was an interesting experience. Um, <laughs> You can buy ATMs for 100 bucks or so, and we did, and we went down to East London to um, uh, take delivery from this warehouse that was full of dead ATMs, dead gambling machines, all sorts of other stuff like that, and we handed over our cash to a couple of guys who looked like they were Al-Qaeda terrorists from Central Casting, <laughs> loaded this ATM into the van and went back to Cambridge, took it to pieces, uh, disassembled what we could, found all sorts of strange stuff, but we didn't actually find the random number generator. So what we then did, following what the criminals in France had done, was to put some electronics into genuine bank cards. So here we have got a genuine working bank card that was issued to one of, member of our team. And what we've done is to instrument it uh, with a CPU and some extra memory and one or two other glue components so that we can um, take a log of all the transactions that it does. And this enables us to log with great precision um, all the bits that went into and out of the card as it does a transaction with an ATM and get a high precision timestamp on them. And our modus operandi was then to go to an ATM and do a dozen balance inquiries one after another followed by a small withdrawal of 20 pounds or so. And this enabled us for one ATM after another to go and get good data on what the uh, random number generators look like. And what we found is that about half of ATMs are using counters. But the counters are mostly going fairly quickly, and so it would be rather hard to exploit. It's possible but difficult. Again, it's one of these academic attacks that you don't actually see in the field. But what we have um, seen, and this uh, we described in a paper which appeared at IEEE Security and Privacy uh, in May, what we have got since then is a live case. And what happened in this case is that a sailor, a British sailor who works on um, the MED, went um, ashore to have a party. And he went to um, that um, fancy street in Barcelona where they've got all the lovely tapas bars. And he went into a, a bar and um, he spent 33 euros on a round of drinks. And the terminal appears to have recorded um, to have done not just one transaction, but 10 anticipatory future transactions. Because thereafter, every hour on the hour, the terminal dunned him for 3,300 euros. And these transactions were filed through three different acquiring banks. And in one case, the transaction appears to have been sort of repeated, because you've got two transactions with the same application transaction counter. Because in addition to the random number generated by the pin entry device, there's a counter generated by the card itself which is also supposed to make transactions unique. And sometimes, if it fails, this is good forensic evidence. So what appears to be happening here is that rather than going to the trouble of predicting the random numbers that you'll get at a particular terminal, you simply trojan the terminal, or you get the terminal to save up future transactions for its future use. And if um, the transaction you did earlier was done with a random number of n, and the terminal now wants to generate a random number of n prime. You just throw away n prime, and you file the transaction with the random number n that you first thought of. And this works. What's the significance of this? Well, as Carsten Lowell pointed out, um, 
once you have got an attack on a system like this, then if you have got malware infestations of large numbers of terminals, and there's been other talks at this conference which describe how that's sadly rather feasible, then your mafiosi can sit in the center and he can have a number of terminals where he harvests transactions from high value card holders and he can have a number of terminals where he replays them. Now these could be terminals in places like the Ukraine um, or they could be high value terminals, Diamond Dealer and Bond Street, um, guy selling Rolls Royce motor cars in Berkeley Square, wherever if you manage to trojan a terminal where in a merchant where you can get negotiable value away, then of course you use that as a cash out place and you can make all sorts of speculations about how a gang might efficiently go about doing this. Now we've not seen that yet, but we have now seen a number of cases where somebody who goes and uses their transaction at some mildly criminal premises, and in this um, uh, sailor's case this is um, some kind of pole dancing bar, right? so there's possibly some kind of mafia involvement in its ownership. We've seen also cases in Krakow in Poland um, where people on a stag night um, went and drank at a particular pub and there was another pub, a brothel next door and the transactions appeared on the, um, to come from the brothel next door and there was another case uh, where people went on a stag night to Lithuania and again transactions that they didn't recognize appeared later on which had obviously been gathered by means of some kind of Trojan terminal. So this is now an attack that's clearly starting to be deployed and modus operandi is there, the kit's obviously there, obviously there's somebody probably in Eastern Europe who'll make you a pin entry device or Trojan you a pin entry device that will do this and it's starting to be done. Um, backhand failures, case RV Parsons, Manchester Crown Court last year. Another vulnerability with EMV is that authorization and settlement are different flows. So what Parsons did was he opened a number of bank accounts and he'd put say £5,000 in a bank account, he'd get a chip and pin card, he'd send his guy out to uh, John Lewis or whatever to buy a big TV, you know, £4,000 transaction on the card. They would then get the receipt which showed all the data pertaining to the transaction, the time, the serial number and so on and Parsons would then go online from his computer and pretend to be the merchant and he would reverse the transaction. Now the reversals weren't authenticated so he could go into the bank system and he could make that card good to go out in an hour's time and buy another TV and another TV and another TV. And there was an interesting trial last year at Manchester Crown Court. I was one of the defense experts and um, the banks um, said he'd stolen two, two and a half million and my joint expert totted up the numbers and found it was seven and a half million and so our barrister had fun with the bank witnesses saying and um, tell me Mr. Bank the extra five million pounds that uh, Mr. Parsons got away with, um, did this come from the account of the merchants or from the accounts of ordinary card holders like Mr. and Mrs. Durer? Um, <laughs> The trial was ended in a funny way when Mr. Parsons decided to become a fugitive all of a sudden and so the jury didn't uh, get a chance to return a verdict in that case. So anyway, this is the sort of thing that goes on. Um, I'm beginning to run out of time so I'll move to the last couple of slides. I think that one of the things we have to think about and which academic security researchers are prone to forget about is that this is to a large extent about how attacks scale. If you've got something like the man in the middle attack, then a couple of students can implement this in a few weeks and you can uh, demonstrate it to a TV journalist, you can get a good five minute video short and it's all good fun for everybody involved. But how do you go about industrializing that? You really have to have a high value target and a well thought out scenario and you know, there may be better returns on your time if you're a crook. And then there's the medium scale stuff where a gang of crooks can take a few million before they get caught, the no pin attack in France for example. And then there's the large scale stuff which scales to nine or ten figures and forces industry action. And um, so far most of the attacks that we've discussed and that we've seen in the field are medium scale attacks. What large scale attacks could happen? Well if you had a, a real malware infestation in the EMV protocol fleet that might be a big deal. You might be able to contain it using analytics, I don't know, are any of the analytics firms working on that? 
I suspect not. Maybe it's a possibility, something to worth, that's worth thinking about. What does EMV hold for the USA? Well, um, the effects of liability shift here might be mitigated by the fact that in America you generally get better consumer protection. Reg E for credit cards, Reg Z for debit cards, and of course the Fed. Second, many cards here propose to use chip and signature, and there you're just getting the technical counterfeiting protection that you get from the card. You're not getting the um, liability shift, and Singapore went down this route. And so we're about to see an interesting natural experiment. If you end up with 100 million Americans using chip and PIN and 100 million Americans using chip and signature, then it's going to be very interesting in three or four years' time to look at the fraud statistics and the statistics of consumer complaints. And that should teach us all quite a lot. In the meantime, there's an awful lot of interesting stuff for people in this community to do because EMV isn't a single protocol that's cast in stone. It's rather a big, rambling, crafty toolkit for you to build payment protocols. And depending on how competent you are and how much attention you pay to the detail, you can either come up with a protocol that's really rather secure or something that is really bloody awful. And this um, applies not just to the mainstream protocol, but to the various things that get bolted on the side, such as using EMV cards as authentication tokens in online banking. Broader lessons, governance at global scale is hard. Nobody is a big enough bull in this crowd to push everybody else around, not even the Fed. And EMV codes largely been superseded by vendor lobby. Another is that feature writers can break anything. Once people start using EMV for all sorts of new platforms and products and protocols, it's going to break again and again and again. The security economics also matter. Issuers and acquirers of different interests, even if they're departments of the same bank. The acquirer wants to get as many merchants as possible, and the issuer is the person who ends up carrying a lot of the cost of fraud, but the issuer isn't the person who's in a position to dictate exactly what systems the merchants use. No one represents the poor consumer, except perhaps, in a half-hearted way, the Fed or the other regulator in your country. So what's the key to building such systems better? Well, proper documentation. Breach notification, responsible vulnerability disclosure all help. The approach we're taking in Europe with our NIS directive, whereby breaches simply get reported to national intelligence agencies is not helpful because national intelligence agencies simply do not care about retail level fraud. They've got other concerns. And so long as uh, governments put their capable geeks in places like the NSA rather than in the Fed, um, you can't expect governments to be the first recourse for a solution to problems of this kind. So, an awful lot of interesting history, an awful lot of um, fascinating attacks, a lot of lessons. Um, the preplay attacks in our 2014 Auckland paper, the no pin attacks appeared in Auckland in 2012. We've got a blog, lightbluetouchpaper.org, where we publicize all sorts of new attacks that we get up with from time to time. I've got a, a page at my home page on all the stuff that we've done on fraud, which pulls together all the material that we got on banking security. On the security economics side, the workshop on economics and information security is the annual event for people interested in this. And the next edition will be in the Netherlands in June 2015. And finally, there's my book, Security Engineering, A Guide to Building Dependable Distributed Systems, which gives a whole lot of the background to this and is available free online. Thank you.